Spirit is a description of Jesus Christ. It is who his character is. Jesus Christ is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, goodness, faith, and self-control. And we are the, he is the one we are supposed to emulate. Essentially, Christianity is basically spiritual Simon says. We do what Jesus did. We follow where Jesus went. We learn to imitate our big brother, Jesus Christ, because as believers, we are heirs, joint heirs with him. He is the first fruit, but he is the one we imitate. Do not imitate me. Do not imitate Brian. Do not imitate Bill. We are unique, and God loves us, but I am not the role model you need to set up your life by. No person is. No human being should be your role model. It should be Jesus Christ himself. He is how you set the example. He is the perfect example of what we are supposed to be like and how we imitate him in our day-to-day -day walk and day-to-day -day life. Well, this morning, we're, or this morning, this afternoon, we're going to take a plunge into a giant pool called joy. And as we continue in our series based on the fruit of the Spirit found in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, and in case you've forgotten what it says, in the Holman Christian Standard Bible, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. We tend to equate happiness with joy. But they are really two totally different concepts. They're two totally different ideas because they come from different sources. Happiness comes from the circumstances around me. If I come home and there's a, there's, um, sorry, I'm going to show you how old I am now. There's Ed McMahon, of course I think he's dead, so I might be a little worried if he shows up, but the, the publisher's clearinghouse truck is sitting in my driveway and they've got the $30 million check waiting for me and I walk up and they say, here, I'm going to be happy. I really am. I'm going to be happy. That's going to be something to be happy. But if the next day... The tax man shows up and he takes all $30 million, my happiness is going to go because my happiness wasn't based, it was based on my circumstances, it was based on what was happening around me. Happiness is, that's where you get happiness from. Happiness is really about the circumstances you live in that you find yourself in. And that's why when we're, we're focused on happiness, our focus is on what's going on around us and not on the true source of joy. Because see, the real source of joy is not our circumstances, it's not the events. Joy comes from a relationship with God and, our, and through understanding the scripture and how it compels us in our quality of life. It changes the events. Everything is focused on Him. And so, he never changes. He never alters. He never fluctuates. He never varies. And so if we can focus on him, our source of joy becomes unmovable. The circumstances can happen, come and go around us, and nothing will phase us. That's why God says we can have the peace that passes all understanding. is because our joy doesn't come from the circumstances around us. It comes from our relationship with God. And that is where we get joy. That is how joy comes to us. Something else you need to understand about what it says here is it's not the Hebrew word joy means to leap or spin around with pleasure. In the New Testament, the word refers to gladness, bliss, and celebration. And it implies it is overflowing and overwhelming. Joy isn't just something you get little dribs and drabs of. It overwhelms your life. It fills every nook and cranny and leaves nothing away. So to have the fruit of joy ripen in your life, you need to recognize the journey involved in getting there. Joy doesn't happen overnight. It's based on your relationship, but you've got to build that relationship. It takes time, diligence, patience, and hard work to make a grapevine produce grapes. If I go out tomorrow and plant grapes in my backyard, assuming my dog doesn't dig them up and destroy the plants, I'm not going to be able to go out there tomorrow night and get a bunch of grapes off of it. It does not work that way. Grapes take time to nurture and develop, just like the fruit of the Spirit takes time to nurture and develop in us. 
And so in our journey of joy, we faced with the waves of apathy, the currents of pessimism, and the deluge of doubt, and the waterfalls of despair. But joy doesn't come from our circumstances. It comes from God. So if you want to see this fruit ripen in your life, you desperately need to know that you need the Holy Spirit to prune away whatever it is that is hindering your joy and then empower us to make some choices that move us closer in a lifestyle of being joyful, of rejoicing. We need to guard against three common joy busters and we need to cultivate some joy builders in our lives. Paul wrote to the church of Galatia about the fruit of the Spirit and he asked a very penetrating question in Galatians 4.15. What has happened to all your joy? The question needs to be asked to us today. What has happened to my joy? What has happened to your joy? What has happened to our joy? William Barclay, and he was a writer, has said that a gloomy Christian is a contradiction in terms, and nothing in history has done Christianity more harm than its connection with black clothes and long faces. So let's look at three common joy busters that often give us long faces. One of the things that tends to steal our joy is we have unsatisfied expectations. You ever feel like you're just going through the routine of life? In the truth, we're known that some of us are discontent with the way our lives are progressing. It could be that your expectations for your marriage or for your job just haven't been met. Or your kids weren't living like you think they should. Perhaps you don't have everything you want. You need a bigger house or a nicer car or a better job. Well, I'm convinced that the spirit of discontentment robs us of joy. Um, we watched a video last Friday night called The Pineapple... Um, sorry. The Pineapple Story. And it's about a missionary who decided to plant pineapples, and the natives kept stealing everything he had. And he got really to the point where he was fighting these natives over pineapples. There was no joy in his life because he was clasping and expecting things that God had never told him he was going to have. He had to learn to surrender everything so that he could find peace, so he could find true joy. We need to learn to judge our expectations based on what God expects of us and what God has told us. If we get discontent, we're running around going, well, I don't like this, and I don't know why I'm at this stupid job, and I don't know why my boss said that to me, and my wife, you don't know my wife, she's a miserable, mean, old, crotchety thing. And no, I'm not talking about anybody's particular wife here, so Brian and Bill, you better not go tell Renee I said that about her. I wasn't talking about Renee. I was talking about how we complain about others, how we complain about the things in our life because we set the expectations based on what we want rather than what God has intended for us. I find it interesting to note that Paul calls contentment a secret. There's a mystery about it. He also had to learn how to live with unsatisfied expectations. Look at Paul. He told God, I want to do this. I want to go and God said, no, I'm sending you somewhere else. No, I'm sending you somewhere else. And he kept trying to ask God to send him into a particular place. And God kept telling him no. And then he started having this problem. And he prayed for God to heal him and take it away. And says, no, my grace is sufficient for you. Your expectation was that I was going to take this away. But I'm going to leave it because you need to learn to rely on my grace. So we set expectations way too high based on what we think is important rather than what God is important. Take my word for it, folks. What God has intended for you is much greater than anything you could possibly imagine or desire on your own. God knows you better than you know yourself. And he loves you completely and totally. And he's not caught up in his ego getting involved in it. So if God plans something for you, it's better, greater, higher than anything you could think of for yourself. He created us. That's right, Bill. So he knows us better than we know ourselves. And so we have these unsatisfied expectations based on what we think we should have rather than what God intended for us. Number two, we have unresolved conflicts. Our joy evaporates when we allow conflicts between ourselves and another person to go on. And when someone offends us, it occupies our mental and emotional attention, and we have little left over for the Lord. 
Anger clouds our eyes of our heart and obscures our view of God, draining away our joy. You know that Jesus himself said that if you got to the altar and you remembered you had something against a brother, that you should put your offering away and go back and make amends right there, that you should go make it right. Now, folks, I'm not talking about, well, I'm mad. Let's, let's, let me use an example. Let me say I'm mad at Bill. Bill's done something really horrible to me. And so I'm going to hold a grudge. I'm going to be mad at Bill. Bill doesn't know I'm mad at him. Am I hurting his Bill? Am I hurting Bill? No. Is Bill upset that I'm upset with him? Probably not. He may not even know it. So who am I only when I'm hurting? Well, first off, the only person I'm really hurting is me. Because I'm destroying my relationship with God. No matter what Bill has done to me, the only person I'm really hurt hurting by holding a grudge is me. I'm running around saying, oh, that old Bill, he's a rotten, mean, old, nasty person, and I just don't like him, and he's, 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 he smells funny, and he never bays, and, you know, and I can come up with all sorts of horrible things to say about Bill. And Bill, you know I'm just kidding, right? But the truth is that God expects us to release those conflicts and to forgive those who hurt us in fact, the Bible says that we're supposed to pray for those who despitefully use us. Look, the truth is that Jesus Christ has forgiven us of much more than we could ever do to each other. There is nothing anybody can do to you that is worse than what we did to him on that cross 2,000 years ago. He was, an in he was innocent. He was pure. He was sinless. He did not deserve to die, and yet he was crucified for my sins and for yours. He died on that cross, but not only did he die on that cross, he came to earth. Now you think about that. He was God incarnate, which means before he took on that human form, he was all-knowing, all-seeing, all-present. In fact, John says that nothing was created without him. He was the agent of creation. He was the only one that we've ever seen. So he pre-existed way before his birth in Jerusalem, or Bethlehem. But he set that all aside, left heaven, and came to earth and took on the form of a little baby. And he lived 33 years, and then he was beaten and crucified because of something he did? No. Because of something I did, or something you did, or something that others did. He paid that price. And the thing is, God isn't running around saying, well, those darry, sorry soul and souls, they crucified my son. I'm going to make them pay. No. He loved us so much that he used that sacrifice to pay for our sin. And so there's no conflict. There's nothing you should be holding against anyone that's worse than what God, what we did to God's son. And the thing is, when you hold on to grudges, Hebrews 12, 14, and 15 says that we're not to allow rash, relational ruptures to fester because what happens? We get bitter. We become angry. We're told to make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile you. When I was growing up, there was this little old lady in my church. She was mean and rotten and always said negative and nasty and gossipy things about people. And everybody basically avoided her because she was just so hard to get along with. Well, she sat through a service one night, and my pastor was preaching, and this is a church when I was a teenager. That's many, 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 many moons ago. And all of a sudden, I noticed out of the corner of my eye that she was crying. And our pastor had been talking about restoring relationships and about how to let go and surrender your grudges to God and let him take care of them. 
And what I found out later on is that she'd had a fight with her son 35 years ago. They had said a bunch of things they didn't mean, and they got so mad at each other that they hadn't spoken in 35 years. And she held on to that grudge, and it festered and grew inside of her, and she just couldn't forgive him. Thing is, she realized in that service that night that the only person she was really hurting was herself. She had knee pain and back aches, and she had a problem with her heart, and she was miserable all the time. So she got home, and she found her son and called him on the phone and asked if she could come over and see him. They lived in the same town. It wasn't like he lived in Nebraska or something, and she was down in Florida. He lived three blocks from her, and they hadn't spoken in 35 years. So she went over and told him that she wanted him to forgive her. She didn't ask him to for, to she didn't tell him that she he should forgive her he sh that she should forgive him that but I can you forgive me son I'm sorry for breaking your heart I'm sorry for hurting you. And he broke down in tears. And I want you to know that those two restored a relationship because they let go of a grudge. The funny part is that mean little old lady became one of the sweetest people in my church. She was so nice and so changed because she let go of the bitterness and the grudge. And that's what happens to us. We can't be joyful if we got a conflict and we won't let it go. If we're holding on to grudges, there's no way you're going to hide the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And you're going to be weak and wimpy because you're holding on to a grudge and hatred. Last week we talked about how love keeps no record of wrongs. Well, if you're still itemizing people's mess-ups, the fruit of joy is going to be squashed in your life. If you're running around doing, well, there's Bill, he did this, and there's Brian, he did that, and there's Susan, and she did this, and there's Lacey, and she did I'm sorry, I'm picking on people in the audience. If you're all you're doing is keeping grudges, keeping their notes of what every time they mess up, you've missed the point. You gotta let it go. You gotta forgive. They make your joy complete by being like minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and in purpose. The third thing is unconfessed sins. The third joy buster is perhaps responsible for chasing out more joy out of lives than any other because guilt can gut your joy faster than anything I know, and sin can send joy very far away. David knew this. Look, he tried to ignore the promptings of the Spirit. Take a look at Psalm 32, 1-5. through five. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as the heat of summer. And then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave me the guilt of my sin. David owns his sin, and his joy returns. Notice verse 11. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous, seeing all you who are upright in heart. Did you catch that? He's not able to rejoice and experience the joy of the Lord until he confessed his sins. That's very similar to what David wrote in Psalm 51, 7 and 8. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have crushed rejoice. The truth is that when we have unconfessed sin in our life, all we end up doing is hiding and covering you got to understand some things about these verses in Psalms. David wrote these after he had did some pretty horrible things. And God had convicted him of his sin. And he broke down and confessed. And God restored his joy. Just like he does for us. When we hold on to things, when we refuse to admit that we have made a mistake, that we have messed up in God's economy, folks, all we do is drive ourselves mad. All we do is crush ourselves. And we keep on doing it until we say, Lord, I'm so sorry. 
I'm a, I have broken your law. I have broken your heart. Forgive me for what I did. Forgive me for that. God will restore your joy faster by doing that than anything else I can imagine. So we've talked about some joy busters, but you know there's some things we can do that will build our joy? <sighs> Lost joy can be restored. See, if you have unsatisfied expectations that have led to a spirit of discontentment, if so, determine to do whatever it takes to learn the secret of wanting everything you have and not necessarily having everything you want. Do you have... Are you involved in some conflict with someone? If so, you need to confess it to God and make it right. Make plans to meet with that person and so you can be reconciled and get back to your journey to joy. Is God's hand heavy on you right now because of some sin that you've not confessed or repented of? Don't keep silent any longer. Tell him right this second. And all it does is chew up your joy when you hold on to unconfessed sin. Acknowledge your transgression and taste the joy that was once yours. You'll be truly glad and rejoice in the Lord again. I have some good news for you. Lost joy can be restored. And as a result of some discontentment, some conflict, and some open sin, David had tubed out spiritually. His joy was a long lost memory. And yet his, he boldly prays in Psalm 51, 12, restore, the more, restore to me the joy of your salvation. God honored his prayer. And he will honor yours. Billy Sunday once said, The trouble with many men is they have got just enough religion to make themselves miserable. There's no joy in religion. Because religion is about you trying to get to God. Christianity, there is joy. And if you've got no joy in your Christianity, then you've got a leak in your Christianity. God not only wants to restore your lost joy, he wants us to cultivate those things that will build lasting joy in our lives so that we don't have any leaks in our Christianity. The Bible gives us at least six ways to experience his joy. Recognize, number one, that God is joyful. We can be helped greatly in our journey toward joy if we learn to see that the Almighty, not as a taskmaster or a meanie that's standing up there waiting to hit us over the head with a two-by-four, but as the God of the universe with a smile on his face. When I first discovered Zephaniah 3.17, I had to read it a couple times because it was such a new thought to me. Listen to how God feels about you. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save, and he will take great delight in you. Did you hear that? He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love, and he will rejoice over you with singing. Think about that. It says that God will delight in you and that God will rejoice and he will sing over you with great joy. That's the creator God we're talking about. God delights in you and breaks into song when he thinks about you. That's pretty cool if you ask me. I love how the Living Bible paraphrases the verse. Is that a joyous choir I sing? I hear? No, it's the Lord himself exalting over you in happy song. <laughs> Psalm 104.31 says, May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. Isaiah 65.18 and 19 said, but, he, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. If we have little or no joy in our lives, get very well because we don't know God well enough. Because joy is one of his character qualities. He is joy. Remember I said that this description in Galatians 5, 22 and 23 is basically a description of who Jesus Christ was and is? Well, he's joy. He's not just has joy. He is joy. God is joyful. He will be even more drawn to him. He's not an aloof judge waiting up to mess us up so we can unleash his fury. He's not looking to bang us on the head. He has created us to be his delight. He finds great joy in you, and he exalts over you in song, in happy song. As we view God this way, we discover that he takes great pleasure in us. He is the good gardener who, holds, who toils over us with constant care. 
He waits patiently for his fruit to ripen, and with great joy he longs to gather in the harvest. Since there is enthusiasm in everything he undertakes and sweet satisfaction in all he does, his joy can be transmitted directly to us by his Holy Spirit. Because his Holy Spirit lives in us. That's exactly what Nehemiah discovered in Nehemiah 8.10. The joy of the Lord is your strength. I pray that we'll experience the Lord's joy as we learn more and know about Him. Number two, another way to build your joy is to rehearse God's attributes in worship. God delights in us and finds great joy in His creation. Then when we celebrate His attributes in worship, we allow our joy to flow right back to Him. Our chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. We've been designed to respond in worship through both reverence and rejoicing. Psalm 66, 1-4 and 4, 1 through 4 says, Shout with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Sing the glory of His name. Make His praise glorious. Say to God, How awesome are your deeds! So great is your power that, you, that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing praise to your name. Collective worship on Sunday should be a culmination of our individual and private worship during the week. If you're not worshiping Monday through Saturday, when you get to church on Sunday, you're wasting your time in worship. Because worship is only as good as each of the individual people who are worshiping, worshiping together and preparing for it. Bible reading, scripture memory, meditation, fasting, and singing is all part of worship. In whatever service you come to on Sunday, the prayer that you are ready to revere God and ready to rejoice. The two worship teams are the worship teams are committed to plan services in my real life church that focus on the holiness and awesomeness of God and provide elements that lead us into joyful exuberance. We celebrate his attributes. The, joy, the fruit of joy will have to blossom, will begin to blossom in our life. When David focused on God's character in Psalm 28, he couldn't help but break out into joy. Listen to verse 7. The Lord is my strength and shield. My heart trusts in him, and I am helped. My heart leaps for joy when I give thanks to him in song. Number three, you need to reaffirm your commitments to others. The first two joy builders are vertical and have to do with love and have to do with your relation with how we view God and how he views us. If we're serious about drinking deeply out of the river of joy, we also have to make sure that we're doing okay on the horizontal dimension as well. You know, we talk in here about praying, we're getting vertical when we pray because we're working on that relationship between us and God. But we also have to work as believers on that relationship with the people around us. And it's a lot harder sometimes to work on the horizontal than it is the vertical because we're dealing with a perfect God even though we're imperfect people. And so one side of the relationship in the vertical is at least perfect. And he's never going to let us down and he's never going to fail us and he's never going to hurt us. But that doesn't necessarily show true when we're dealing with people because we are human and we do let each other down. But if you're going to do okay in the horizontal dimension, then you need to live in biblical community with others. You can't do it alone. If you're not going to a church, if you're not involved in a church family in a relationship, you're being a Lone Ranger Christian. Even the Lone Ranger had Tonto. If you don't even have Tonto, you're worse off than he was. Christianity was not meant to be a singles event. It is meant to be a community, a family a church is about living together, doing life together. Thank you, Bill. Uh, so that with con when contemplating whether or not it would be better to die and spend eternity with his Lord, the Apostle Paul concludes that it would benefit the church greatly if he hung around for a while. Look at Philippians. Philippians 1, 25 and 26. Since I am persuaded of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that because of me your confidence may grow in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Here's the point. As I connect with you and you connect with me, our joy will overflow. We need each other. If you're not attending church on a regular basis or coming and not interacting with others, you might as well be sitting at home watching television. You're not spreading joy. You're jeopardizing the joy of others. 
You're not supposed to come to church and sit in the pew and stare at the back of somebody's head for an hour and then go home and think that you've participated in Christianity, that you've been part of church life. <clears throat> what happens on Sunday morning is a very, very small part of living in community, of living in a community of and Christianity, of living out your faith. That has a very small portion of it. And if I sit in a pew and stare at the back of somebody's head and that's the only interaction I have with somebody, I'm not going to know that person. If I never sat down and talked with Bill, if I sat in the chair behind him and only ever saw the back of his head, and after an hour we all got up and leave, I wouldn't know if I ran into him on the street. No marriage works that way. Brian doesn't sit behind Renee all day long and look at the back of her head and say, and never talk to her. And they sit and listen to television that way, and they get up and leave, and they never say anything to each other. The relationship wouldn't exist. You're not going to have a relationship with other people within the church unless you spend time with them, unless you learn to make them part of your life. Luke 15 records, and I'm sorry, got ahead of myself. When we live in loving relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ, we're more joyful, and we're helping others get fill up their joy to restore them. And we gather with other believers for accountability, growth, prayer, and study. God will use each of us to raise the joy temperature around us. Number four, you need to reignite your passion for evangelism. One of the best ways to build your joy in your life is by talking to others about Jesus. And I'm not talking about you having to get up here and preach. I'm not talking about pounding over people over the head. I'm talking about sharing with others what God has done for you, what Jesus has done in your life. We need to hear that. It helps. You can be active in sharing your faith without pounding people on the head. Luke 15 records for us how much rejoicing takes place when the lost are found. When the lost sheep is recovered, verse 5 says, the owner joyfully puts it on his shoulders and then goes home and calls his friends and neighbors together and declares in verse 6, Rejoice for me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven when one sinner who repents Jesus reminds us in John 4.36 that we can be filled with glad joy when we participate in the process of sharing the gospel. Even now the reaper draws his wages, and even now he harvests for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Not only do we appreciate God's gift of grace in our lives, when we tell each other about Jesus, we also get to see the inexpressible joy of those who get to experience new birth. Release your problems to the Lord. One of the hallmarks of joy is that it can be experienced in the midst of the most intense sorrow and loss. Often we define happiness as the absence of something undesirable. We think of happiness as no pain, no suffering, no disappointment. Everything goes the way we want to. But joy is the proper response to the presence of something desirable, God himself. In Acts 16, the authorities beat Paul and Silas, and after they were severely flogged, they were thrown into prison. In order to make sure they didn't escape, they were put in an inner cell and had their feet fastened to the stops. If that were me, I'd have been sitting there shaking in my boots, well, in their sandals, because they didn't have boots. But what did Paul and Silas do? They were praying and singing praise hymns to God. They were sitting in prison, shackled, surrounded by guards, and they're sitting there in prison singing praise to God. The word for praying is not the word used for making requests, but rather the word used for praise or worship. Instead of asking God to get them out, they turn this tough situation into an opportunity to rejoice. <laughs> it reminds me of Matthew Henry, a Bible scholar from the 1700s. After some thieves had robbed him and took his wallet, he wrote in his diary, let me be thankful first because I was never robbed before. Second, let me be thankful because they took my wallet. They didn't take my life. Third, because although they took my, all, my, my wallet and all my stuff, it was not much. And fourth, because I was the one who was robbed and not the one who was doing the robbing. The only way to have an attitude like that is to release our problems to God. Because he's in charge, we can have joy no matter what happens. Paul put it this way in 2 Corinthians 7, 4. If all our troubles, my joy knows no bounds. In all our troubles, joy knows no bounds. James 1, 2 challenges us to consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many, of many kinds. This takes a conscious decision 
We're committed to work at it. And while we can't manufacture joy, we can give our problems to the Lord and lean on Him and trust Him and depend on Him to walk through us, walk with us through it. And I'm not talking about running around all happy, happy, joy, joy. I'm not talking about being stupid. Oh, that's such a wonderful thing. I'm so glad you ran over my foot and I have to go to the hospital with that truck. I'm talking about joy, not being silly happy. I'm talking about focusing on what God has intended. But the best way to focus on joy is to be close in your relationship with Jesus Christ. We talked about last week the way to experience the fruit of the Spirit is to be obedient to Christ and submit to the Spirit on a daily basis. To discover joy, we must be abandon the search for it and go looking instead for the one who is joy himself. Joy is the flag that flies over the castle of our hearts announcing that Jesus is in residency today. John 15, 10 and 11 puts it this way. He who believes in the Son of God, who adheres to, trusts in, and relies on him, as the testimony possesses the divine attestation within himself, he who does not believe God in this way has made him out to be and represented him to be a liar, because he do, has not believed, put faith in, adheres to, and relied on the evidence that God was born regarding his son. And that is the testimony God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his son. If we want the kind of joy that is complete, lacking nothing, then we must remain close to him. Apart from him, you can bear no fruit. He is the vine, we are the branches, and we produce absolutely no fruit unless we get a source from somewhere else. If I go out and plant a tree in the ground and it has no roots, I cut them off, that tree is never going to flower. It's never going to grow fruit. I can't hang fruit in midair and expect it to develop and ripen. It has to be attached to a tree because that's where it gets its food. It's where it gets its water. It's where it gets its nourishment. Fruit doesn't grow by itself. Well, we will not grow. We will not produce fruit unless we're plugged in to the real source, the real power, and his name is Jesus Christ. A branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. If I walked out in my backyard and chopped a branch off the tangerine tree, with a bunch of little green tangerines on it and brought it in and set it on my desk, the only thing those tangerines ever do would rot. Because the minute I cut them off from the source, they're dead. And all they're going to do is rot. They're not going to get any riper. It might look pretty for a day, but so does a dead person when you visit them, when you go to a viewing at a funeral home. They're all nice and pretty, but you don't want to spend any time around them. And they've been embalmed. At least they are in the United States. They're filled with all sorts of chemicals, so they preserve their bodies. But it doesn't make them alive. It just means they're a well-preserved corpse. If we don't plug in to Jesus Christ, that's all we really are is a well-preserved corpse. Last week, I heard about a film critic that Sunny Pictures had created. Um, a fake guy, and he had him say all sorts of nice things about several of their movies. And the pretend person said one movie was another winner and referred to the male lead in the second film as the year's hottest new star. They made fun of the company for doing this while others were very angry, said that they'd stoop so low. I can't help but think that some of us are trying to just write copy for the fruit of the joy in our lives. People can see fake fruit, and you're a fraud if you're a fruit. Or are you a fruit bearer? Are you a Christian? Are you a charlatan? Are you playing charades? Are you praising God? The only way to have real joy to, is to nurture your relationship with Jesus Christ and keep in step with the Spirit on a daily basis. See, we can pretend to bear fruit. We can, I mean, I can go out and buy a plastic plant that has plastic fruit on it. And it all looks nice and good. But I don't think you really want to go eat it. I had a grandfather once who we had a basket of fruit sitting on the table. It was wax. He ate one of the apples. Told us it tasted horrible. Wanted to know why he kept eating it. Well, because it was fruit. I thought it was good for me. It was fake fruit. 
wasn't real. He got no nourishment out of it. All he got was wax. Actually, I think it made him sick of his stomach, to be truthful with you. But the reality is that fake fruit doesn't help anybody. If you're not plugged into the real source, that's all you're going to produce is fake fruit. Okay. So guard yourself against those joy busters that crash into your life like a tidal wave. Be vigilant. Ask someone to hold you accountable so you can learn the secret of contentment so that you will keep short accounts with people and to help you get into the habit of regular confession of your sin. And this week, I got a challenge for you. By this Saturday, I want you to pick one of our joy builders. And I want you to work on that joy builder this week. Practice it. Put it into application in your life. Pick one that your weekend that you need to work on. Do you need to recognize that God is joyful? Do you need to rehearse God's attributes in worship? Do you need to reaffirm your commitments to others? Do you need to reignite your passion? Do you need to release your problems to the Lord? And, or do you need to remain close to Jesus? And also, this week I want you to read through the book of Philippians every day for a week. The word joy or rejoice is used 19 different times in the book of Philippians. And as you read it, ask God to ripen the fruit of joy in your life. Romans 14, 17 says, After all, the kingdom of God is not a matter of getting the food and drink one likes, but instead, it is righteousness, that state which makes a person acceptable to God, and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Count it all joy, brothers and sisters. God loves you. God desires to see you grow spiritually, to see the fruit of the Spirit develop in your life. I pray that you will take seriously God's admonition to grow in joy. I plead with you, do not simply decide, oh, you know, that's all well and good, but you don't know my boss, or you don't know my friends, or you don't know my sister, or you don't know my girlfriend, or you don't know my wife, or my husband, or my dog. Don't let the circumstances around you steal your joy. Don't pretend that its happiness is joy. Bad things happen all the time. The difference between a believer and a non-Christian is that when the bad things happen, we have somebody to cling to and to hold on to and adhere to. His name is Jesus Christ. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. Yes, bad things happen to us. Bad things happen to me. Bad things happen to Bill. God has never left you. He walks with you through it. He never promised you to take you out of the world, but to be with you while you walked through the world. If you're hearing my voice tonight, and you don't know him as Savior and Lord, then you've got the first step you've got to take is you've got to accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. You need to recognize that he did die for your sins. He did die because of the evil you do because of the lies, or because of the cheating, or because of the hatred, or because of the bitterness, or because of the anger. I don't know what sin it is. And by the way, in God's books, all sin are the same. You know, only humans try to categorize sin, but God sees all sin the same way. All sin is worthy of death. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. You can't avoid that. It, God sees them all the same. And the only choice you have is to accept his free gift of salvation and swap out your sin for his Savior. Because that's really what it boils down to. So if you don't know him, I pray that you will seek to have him change your heart and your life. If you need to talk about, you need to understand more about who Jesus is, um, Bill and Brian and Renee and myself... We'll be here for a little while after service. You can talk to us. If you want to go someplace, we can go up into the prayer room upstairs and we can talk about Jesus and, we'll be, and I'll be glad to share with you about Jesus Christ and what he's done in my life. Okay. If you do know him, where is your joy tonight? Perhaps you need to make some changes in how you relate. 
Do you need to put one of those joy builders into play? I can tell you right now, the one that I get caught up in most is I forget that God is joyful. Sometimes I think he's out to get me. I know better in my head, but when bad things start to happen, I start thinking, oh God, why are you doing this to me? Well, he's not doing this to me. He loves me. He's walking through it with me because he never promised to take me out of it. But I have nothing bad happening to me that doesn't happen to everybody else. We live in a world that has fallen and in sin. And there are a lot of things wrong with it. But God made a way to save us and to restore us to the relationship he created us for in the first place. Join me as we close in prayer. Father, we love you. I thank you that you have made our joy complete. Your Son, Jesus Christ, is more than just, does more than just have joy. He is our joy. He is our love. He is our gentleness and our kindness and our long-suffering and our peace. You sent him to die for us, but he didn't stay dead. He rose again, and one day he's returning again. And I know that your word says that you're not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. All learn to restore the relationship with you. You desire for us to return and you're calling. You're asking your children, come back. Come back to me. Let me heal you and restore you. Let me bring you real joy. Not the happiness that flees in an instance, but true, overwhelming, overflowing joy. Not dependent on the circumstances, but foundationed in our relationship with Jesus Christ. In your most precious son's name, amen. If you heard my voice tonight, and you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, we're going to be out front in the foyer. We would love to hear about it. Um, if you're listening to me on live stream, and I really don't know who's on live stream at this point, and you need some more information, you want to know more about who Jesus is, um, there's a link on our website. Brian, could you type that into the chat for us, please? And it's called Jesus 1-800-JESUS-20. Uh, and it's the goodnews.org. Either one of the, that website or that phone number, you can learn more about Jesus Christ. Goodnews.org will help you explore who Jesus was and how to build that relationship with him. Please, if you've accepted him, thank you, 188 Jesus 20. I put in 100 in there, but um, the, the uh, goodnews.org has a link on there where you can find a church in your area where you can get plugged in. Um, so, And that's what you do need to do. Um, as much as we love having you come to Grace, and as much as we enjoy the opportunity to minister to you, our real purpose is to help you grow as believers and to bring the light of God's Word in a dark place. And so our desire is to see you grow as believers. And unfortunately, because this is a virtual reality, the best place for you to do that is to get plugged into your local church to find a group of like-minded believers who desire to help and encourage each other, who teach God's word and are faithful to each other and to him. So... I encourage you that if you're not in a home church and you're not in a real life church right now, that you need to help your you need to find one. And Brian and I will be more than glad to try to help you. Um, but we're not all knowing, and I have never lived anywhere outside of the Southeast United States. Well, with the exception of Texas and Chicago, but um, so I don't know a real whole lot about anywhere else or other countries. Um, if you live in Spain, I'm sorry, I don't know where to tell you to go to church because I've never been to Spain.
and Brian and Bill will help those of you in New Zealand. Anyway, thank you for coming tonight. I, I do want to remind you that we do have morning devotionals at 3.15 SLT, Monday through Saturday. And then we have services here on Wednesday night, Saturday night, and Sunday night at 5 p.m. SLT, and then 5 a.m. on Sunday at SLT, SLT. And then we have a Friday night Bible study here at 5 p.m. And then if you just want to come and hang out with us, there's a circle of rainbow chairs out there. And um, those rainbow chairs, we just sit and visit. Sometimes we pull out the weird motorcycles and costumes and we be silly. But it's just an opportunity to grow, to help and de develop relationships with each other. It's no theology. We're not going to sit there and argue Bible or pound you over the head with the scriptures or anything like that. It's just an opportunity to visit and fellowship and to grow together. Um, we do that Mondays, Wednesdays, Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursday nights out there in the rainbow chairs. <laughs> Anyway, thank you for coming. I'm going to get off voice now. Um, may God bless and keep you. You are dismissed.